So we're live. Uh, welcome to the Portland Park Public Library's uh, Interacting with the Internet uh, series. This is part two of two parts. Uh, this is only going to cover security. Last week was the Interacting with the Internet part one, which covered privacy. There's a lot of topics here that are similar, but I, I broke it down. So most of the privacy and information related stuff was last week and all the security stuff is this week. So there's a lot more to go through. I have a lot more slides. So I might be going kind of fast. I have to try to keep it in under an hour. So sorry, I apologize ahead of time if I go a little fast. I'll try to cover just about everything in as much of a, as much detail as I can while also keeping it kind of brief. So I'll just get started. Uh, PowerPoint wants to work. There we go. What is internet security? Internet security is security from attacks and threats uh, from the World Wide Web as well as from files and applications from the internet. That's, I mean, you, you could kind of just say, what is internet security? Well, it's in the name, it's security from the internet, more or less. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Be cautious of what you do on the internet and take measures to ensure you're safe from threats and make sure your information is safe. And, uh, I guess I could, uh, I guess I could, I guess that's that. That's the entire, uh, it's the entire webinar. Uh, thank you for joining. This was the uh, Orland Park Public Library. My name is Matt Montalvo. Uh, and that's it. No, there's, there's a lot more to go through. Things to watch out for. When browsing the internet, be sure to use common sense. That's an important one. I said this last week with uh, privacy. It's a little bit more important here. Use common sense and watch for sites or emails that might be dangerous. Don't click on anything that seems suspicious. Uh, so statistically speaking, 99% of the time when someone gets hacked or their information is stolen or something bad happens to them, it's typically user error. It's typically the user's fault. What does that mean? It's like, oh, did I, did I give myself a virus? Well, kind of, yeah, you, you, you probably kind of did. Uh, if you, obviously, you wouldn't get a virus or your information wouldn't, wouldn't be compromised at all if you never touched your computer, but obviously it's not really feasible to just never touch your computer, stay away from the internet forever and never do anything. Obviously, you know, you're, you got to use the internet for something. You're, you, that's the whole reason you have a computer or, you know, your phone. You're, oh, I just never use your email, never use your phone, never connect to anything, always take the SIM card out. You don't want to live like that. That's insane. You don't have to do that. Just you know, use your, use common sense. If something looks kind of sketchy, you're on a website and it's like, hmm, this doesn't look, something, something's up with this. It just, you know, doesn't rub right with you. And maybe you shouldn't, you know, click on a link that looks suspicious. You shouldn't visit a weird website that looks weird. You sort of use common sense most of the time. Uh, it's really important with phishing. We'll get into phishing very quickly here. So that's, I'll have more to say on that. Always make sure when you're filling out forms or putting sensitive information in like uh, credit card numbers, social security numbers, even your address or something, uh, make sure you're using a legitimate reputable website or service. Uh, people are concerned every single time that they put information on the internet. They think, oh, I have to put my social security number on this form for like a job application. People, the whole internet, I'm putting this on the internet, people can see it. Well, yes, but it's, probably highly unlikely that anyone's ever going to get a hold of that information, depending on the service that you're using. If you're putting your social security number in a encrypted form on the IRS website for the Internal Revenue Service for the federal government of the United States, no one's going to get a hold of that. No, there, that's, that's, that's pretty secure. You're not going to, you know, that, that, that information safe with the IRS and they need it for obviously verification purposes. Uh, typically, when you like are on a website uh, for like filling out a job application, typically they'll use an accredited third party service or a form on the internet. So, same information that they'd ask for, stuff that you'd typically find on a uh, job application. They'll ask for your social security number, your address, stuff like that. That information is usually safe. That's why they use a third party. It's typically probably a company you've never heard of, or it might be one that you are familiar with. And that information is safe and secured and encrypted. You don't have to worry about that. The ones you should be worried about is like, if again, uh, we're, I'm, I'm going to talk about phishing. Uh, if, if, if you're emailing someone your social security number or your address, well, then 
everyone who's, you know, that you're sending that email to has access to that. They have a copy of your, the information that you're writing out in plain text. So I would never like email anyone a social security number or any information like that. There's no reason you should be emailing someone a social security number or credit card information or any sensitive information like that. That shouldn't be in an email uh, because then that is out there. It should usually be in a form on the internet from a secure service and most are. So that's something to keep in mind. We're gonna go over general types of threats. Uh, this is kind of just like a terminology thing. We're gonna go over this. Most of these kind of sound all the same, but they're very different. So we're gonna go over different types of threats, different types of uh, things that could be probably pretty harmful to your computer. So we got virus, everyone's concerned about virus. Everyone's heard of all these, virus, malware, worm, spyware, ransomware, Trojan, people don't know what these are. Uh, the two that, at least the three that everyone should be familiar with is virus, malware, and a lot of people don't know what the difference between those two is, and there's a reason for it. Uh, and the other one, Trojan, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Trojan. Trojan's a common one that um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, but a virus is a piece of software that affects computers and it copies itself after attaching itself to programs or data files in the system of a computer. So it's just a general, your computer's got a virus, you don't want a virus on your computer. It's, it's, it's gonna do bad stuff. Uh, malware, malicious software. That's why malware is kind of like how Microsoft is, you know, micro software, micro computing. You know, it's, it's, it's a two part, they just shortened both words, added it into one word. So malware, pretty self-explanatory malicious software. Software that performs actions without the user's knowledge usually to harm or steal data. Yeah, yeah. So uh, most malware, I don't know, they, yeah, it basically comes in those two flavors. It harms a device or steals data. Uh, I could have said and slash or steals data. Some malware is specifically designed to steal data and then destroy your computer. And so it does both. So malware can do both actually. Uh, worm, standalone piece of software that replicates itself and uh, to spread to other devices. Worms are bad, really bad. Uh, kind of, we won't go over that. I was gonna, there, there's another one that I could add is rootkit. Rootkit's kind of like a, kind of like a combination of like malware, worm, and virus. They're pretty, they're pretty bad. Uh, spyware, software that gathers information about a person or organization without their knowledge. So, uh, spyware can monitor and log activity at, uh, on the system it's on. Spyware is pretty bad. Uh, and the reason spyware is bad is because you're filling out, like I said, if you're gonna fill out credit card information, social security number, that information is safe when you're filling it out on a secure form. Well, if you have spyware on your computer, it, it doesn't matter if you're using a secure form or not. This piece of software tracks everything you do on your keyboard and so it might look out for you typing in your social security number. And I mean, that's easy to look for because you got three digits, then two digits, then four digits. It'll wait for you to type those numbers out. It'll log that. You're, they're able to find that through the key logging you know, service that's part of the spy, spyware. And then they have your social security number. And chances are, if you're putting in your social security number, you're also putting in your name and your address and all the other sensitive information that people could use to open a bank account in your name or pretty much do anything. They could, they could steal your entire identity. So spyware is one to look out for as well. Ransomware, software that locks information, typically the entire system itself, taking the device hostage for ransom. Uh, this one confuses a couple people uh, quite a bit. People are like, wait, what? They like take my computer hostage? Yep. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's very terrifying. So you, if you get, if you go on a website and oop, you got ransomware on your computer, you might not notice for like a week. And then one day you turn on your computer, bam, it doesn't even boot windows. It doesn't even, it doesn't do anything. The second you press the power button, it doesn't have any, you have no input over the entire computer and it'll just have a big screen that says, this computer is locked. You cannot, I, I now own your computer. You have no access to this computer. The only way I'll let you ha access your computer ever again is if you send 
$2,000 to this Bitcoin address in Bitcoin, and you have to do it within 30 days, or I'm going to destroy this computer and all the information on this computer, I'm going to put out on the internet to the public. And that's, uh, that's pr it's pretty scary when that happens. Uh, it's exactly, it's, it's, it's like people might say, like, that's impossible. No, it's very possible and ransomware does exist. It's very scary. Uh, that's typically harder to get, but that exists and ransomware attacks actually happen quite a bit. On the one that most people are familiar with, Trojan, malware that uses code to disguise itself to get in uh, deep into a system, typically creating a backdoor to steal information or compromise the system itself. Typically a Trojan is working in tandem with any of the other ones on the list. So a Trojan uh, usually is keeping a vi that's why it's like it's like a Trojan horse. So you know it's a, you know a virus that hides itself into the computer. Uh, usually if you're on like a Windows laptop it'll hide itself as like a system file that Windows needs and then Windows will be like oh yeah we need this we have this file no problem and Windows will let the file into its you know deep into its uh, file system and up oh, it's a virus and might be ransomware. So that's how people can get something as scary as like ransomware on their computer. That's it's just like that. It's like a Trojan Trojan horse. Phishing. We got this phishing. Yay. Phishing and scammers. Uh, phishing is the fraudulent fraud, fraudulent practice of pretending to be a reputable company or organization and trying to get individuals to give out personal information like credit card numbers or passwords or anything really social security number. Uh, usually fish uh, phishing they don't ask for like, they typically don't ask, they don't straight up ask you like, uh, you know, you don't like get an email. That's uh, here. Typically phishing occurs via email and people will pretend to be companies sending a message saying something is wrong with your account. A lot of you fix your account, but the website they have you sign into is not real. So yeah, so as I was gonna say, uh, when people think of phishing, they typically think it's like, oh, it's an email from like, Bank of America, and it's saying to give me your social security number and your mother's maiden name and date of birth. And obviously, I don't think, you would think nobody would fall for that. Usually elderly people or people that might not know as much about like how the internet works, they would fall victim to that. And even if only, you know, how hard is it to send an email? It's very easy. So what these people will do is they'll copy the email and they'll just send it to 5 million people. And as long as five people out of those 5 million fall for it, they have five people's personal information, social security numbers, credit cards, uh, address, they have everything they need. And I mean, the only, only one person really needs to fall for it for, you know, the person who's fishing to get their way. So it, do, it doesn't need to happen. And the, and the scary thing is you might think like, oh, so only 0.0001% of people actually fall victim to it. No, the real number, and I don't have that statistic with me, and it changes, the, the number is actually pretty high. It's something like 4 or 5% of people, which is like a lot. If there's like a billion, you know, fake emails in a year that are sent out and 5% of them actually, you know, people give them their information. That's a lot. That's actually quite a bit of people. And you might also fall victim to it usually, but again, they don't usually disguise themselves as, hey, take my word for it. I'm Bank of America. Give me your social security number. They don't do that. What they'll do is right here, and I have an example on the next page, we'll see, they'll make their email look legit. They'll hide their email to be like, they can just straight up hide their email so you don't know what the email is, or they'll make their, their email look legit. So if I was like, if I wanted to pretend to be Bank of America, chances are, I don't know what Bank of America's email address, what their domain is. So if I wanted to disguise myself, my name is Matt Montalvo, if I wanted to be, pretend to be working for Bank of America, I could probably find an available domain on the internet that I could buy, like Bank of America, US, I mean, Bank of America USA is probably taken, but I don't think Bank of America uses Bank of America USA. And that seems pretty legit. So I could be like, or I could do like a state. I doubt they have Bank of America, Illinois. 
So I could be bankofamericailinois.com. And then I can change my email to be Matthew Montalvo at bankofamericailinois.com. Or if I wanted to even look more legit, I could be like help dot bank of America or help dot bank of America or you know so, something that looks legitimate uh, an email that actually looks like it's coming from Bank of America and people that might not know any better they'd be like oh this this email they're saying it's their Bank of America and they need my login information but who's the sender and you look at the person who sent it and it's help or like services at bank of America Illinois.com sounds pretty legit Nope, it isn't. That's somebody who went out of their way to make it look legit. And people can do that. And that's how they get away with it. And so all the information that's given out from phishing is recorded and sent to an impersonator compromising your account information. So like uh, this Amazon one, uh, check here, check sender's address and look for something that's suspicious on these kinds of emails. Never click on links or download attachments from people you don't know. That's an important one. Uh, if there is a link or like an a, attachment like a file that's on these emails that look suspicious. If you ever get an email that looks shady, never download anything from, don't download any attachments, don't click on any links. Uh, a link can be faked to look like something else. And we'll, we'll see on the example here. I can make a link say like, hey look, it's a YouTube video. And the, the link can be www dot youtube.com slash watch slash or you know whatever youtube it looks like it's youtube youtube.com so it's www.youtube.com it's obviously youtube.com nope you can easily just hide it you can i you click on it and it could bring you to google.com i could just change google.com to look like on the email you know whatever i want and so is you think you're clicking on youtube then you're actually clicking on downloading a virus to your computer uh, here we go. Example of phishing, fake Amazon. So this happens all the time. I actually see pretty, I, I, I see quite a bit of fake emails every single day, actually. Uh, so here's one that looks like Amazon. And when I look at fake emails, almost a lot of them are Amazon. So these are just things to look out for. So we immediately, we're just going to start from the top and go to the bottom. We're not even going to analyze email right now. We're just going to look at who sent it from Amazon. It just says Amazon. Their name is Amazon. So just off of the name alone, it's like, oh, well, this is from Amazon. Nope, they just made their name Amazon. That doesn't mean anything. So what is the, what's the email address? Well, the email address is management at amazoncanada.ca. Remember what I was saying? I said like, oh, Bank of America, Illinois.com. This is amazoncanada.ca almost looks like Amazon and they probably could have gotten something that I mean chances are amazoncanada.ca is actually taken by Amazon they probably own that one so this is an email that somebody made to hope that you didn't notice that they forgot the a and if you just glance at it really quickly management at amazoncanada.ca looks pretty legit all right uh, and this is sent to a Canadian address. So if you think like, oh, it's not .com, well, that's actually what they use for Canada. So that looks pretty legitimate right off the bat. If you just glance, you wouldn't catch that. That'd be management at amazoncanada.ca. Bam, that looks legit, but it isn't. So that's something that you could notice and you'd be like, yep, this is fake. You have a giant logo, amazon.com. Yep, that's Amazon's logo. Something that I would note and it's not usually a big identifier and I wouldn't, I wouldn't typically be too, I wouldn't analyze it everything the way that I'm about to analyze this, but something I'd notice is that the picture for the logo for amazon.com kind of looks a little fuzzy. Uh, it's a little pixelated. Uh, that's not just because of the uh, image that I put in the PowerPoint. It, it looks like that in the email. Chances are Amazon, if they actually sent you an email, it probably wouldn't be that fuzzy. Typically, they'll send a really high resolution picture or image in their email, uh, or they have what's called a vector mapped image. So it doesn't matter how much you zoom in, it shouldn't pixelate or get fuzzy at all. Uh, so a legitimate website, if it was legitimately Amazon, it wouldn't be fuzzy like that. Uh, most companies, most reputable websites, most services, 
they'll either not have any graphics on their email at all, or if they have graphics, it'll look a little bit more professional than this. But again, that's not anything I'd uh, typically go on about. I, I want to say like something like, I think like the IRS, I think when the IRS send you an email, they use really low quality images. So it's not, it's, it's not like, oh, this email is real, has a really low quality image. It's obviously fake. No, I wouldn't say that, but it's something that you should look out for. You know, I said, use common sense. If you use the email, if you browse the email and you see that it looks like fuzzy, you might want to start analyzing and looking for like the sender and for other stuff. That's when you should probably start realizing like, hmm, something's up. Something's not right here. This is, this is kind of sketchy. So I wouldn't say that it's a identifier that something's wrong, but I would say that like a low quality image like that, I would say it's kind of sketchy. Dear client, now as you pointed out, generic non-personalized greeting. It doesn't say dear Matthew, it says dear client. Why does it say dear client? Well, because anybody can, you know, this could be directed at uh, absolutely anybody. It, it could be, they, they take this email and they send it to 5 million people. So yeah, we've sent you this email because we have strong reason to believe that your account has been used by someone else in order to prevent fraudulent activity from occurring. We're opening an investigation into this matter. Ooh, we've locked your Amazon account. You have 36 hours to verify it or we have the right to terminate it. Okay, sure, that's pretty scary. Wow, you wanna obviously take action, right? To confirm your identity with us, please click the link below. Look at this link, it looks pretty legit. www.amazon.com. Obviously that link goes to Amazon. Nope, if you hover over it with the mouse, it would say, HTTP redirect and then a bunch of letters dot com. So that that website's actually going to bring you somewhere else. It's it looks like Amazon.com, but it's not. That's not Amazon.com at all. And what it's going to bring you to is if I go back to this first page, it'll bring you to a website that looks exactly like that. And if you look at that, that looks exactly like an Amazon.com login screen. And I did not just take a picture of Amazon's login screen and put it in this PowerPoint. This is an actual picture of a scam phishing like website. This is a fake website. And if you look at the URL on your browser after clicking the link, it'll not, it won't say amazon.com on the top. It'll typically have like a bunch of dots and stuff, but people typically won't look at that. They'll know, oh, but I clicked on something that said amazon.com and look where it brought me. This is Amazon. No, it's not. This is not Amazon. You have been, you, you are being swindled. This is not Amazon at all. And if you put in your email and you put in your password, bam, the second you set, you press sign in, someone else now has that recorded. They have your email address and your password for amazon.com. All they need to do is sign in. They have all your credit cards that are attached to your account. They have access to that. They could order whatever they want, change the address. They could buy stuff and have it sent to their house. They could do that. And chances are that's not where it stops at. Remember the, the email says, oh, you got to confirm your identity. So after you sign in, they'll probably have you put your full name, they'll have you put your date of birth, they'll have you put in your credit card information, they'll have you put in your social security number, they'll, they'll get as much information out of you as possible. And typically what they do is they have it on multiple forms. And so the first page will just ask for your name and you'll hit next. The second you hit next, they have that saved. They own that. They do that intentionally because if they just gave you a big form that had, we want all this information, typically you'll, that's when you notice, oh, this isn't legit. They want all this information. So they don't tell you how much information they want right off the bat. They'll only ask for your name, you hit next. Oh, well now they want my address. Well, it's Amazon, that makes sense. So you put in your address and you hit next. Oh, they want my phone number? Okay, sure, you put in your phone number and you hit next. And typically, You'll keep going until it asks for more and more private information. And people typically stop at social security number because they're like, oh, this is fake. And if it took you that long to figure out that it's fake, unfortunately, they already, it's already too late. They have your password, your email, your phone number. They have everything. They have everything. And chances are like if that your password is the same password to get into your email, 
They could log into your email. They can change your password for Amazon. They could change your password for your email. They could do all sorts of stuff with just that information alone. And if you don't stop a social security number and you give them your social security number, they could open credit cards, open bank accounts. They can close bank accounts. They can they basically control your life. They can control your life just off of an email that looks legit. It's, it's pretty bad. And again, I said phishing, uh, usually it's like four or 5% of them are successful. They send a million of these a day. I don't know what the number is. Probably, it's probably a lot. There's people making a lot of money. And of course, I assure you, it's very illegal. Phishing is against the law. Uh, don't do it. That's not a way to make money. I wouldn't recommend doing it. Uh, but this is something you should watch out for. It's things to look out for. Again, if you use common sense and you analyze, oh, okay, well, management, Amazon, that's not Amazon. You just delete it. Just delete the, uh, the email right away. A lot of these automatically get filtered. So if you have like Gmail or Comcast, these might get caught in a spam filter and you won't even get them. It'll just immediately go to your junk email. So that's good, but not all of them. Compromised information on the internet. So if you filled out those forms on you know, your fake email, your password's now compromised. What do you do? Well, it, uh, you can actually have your password compromised without even doing anything. Uh, data breaches exist. I said 99% of the time, it's usually user error. Uh, what about that 1%? Well, I've got you covered on that. Uh, data breaches and lists of cracked passwords are shared on the internet and make it easy for hackers to steal your accounts and information. Take measures to ensure your information and passwords are safe. Uh, okay, how do I know if there's been a data breach in my uh, password somewhere? They actually have a website you can use. So if you go to have I been pwned, that's what, that's what, it's, that's what the word stands for. Have I been pwned, P-W-N-E-D.com. Go to have I been pwned.com. They actually have a website where you can figure out whether or not you've been pwned. I put in my personal, one of my personal email addresses, and as you can see, it says, oh no, pwned. Pwned on 10 breached sites in one paste. So over the course of my whole life, uh, one of my personal email addresses has been compromised. Uh, I don't know, probably Yahoo 10 years ago when they had a data breach or something, my password for my Yahoo account was exposed. So, and it shows up on this, on this website. It'll say, hey, your email shows up on a compromised list of data breaches. You should change your password. And it doesn't mean, oh, did I lose everything? Probably not. Data breaches reveal lots of information. And there being a data breach doesn't even necessarily mean that they have all your personal information. It just means that some information with your email has been compromised. It shows up on lists. All you should do and all that you really can do is change your password for as much stuff as you can think of. Uh, if you see on the internet like, oh, there was a Google data breach, well then change your password for Google. Most of these services actually are pretty smart. If there's a data breach with Google, well, what'll actually happen is you'll log into Google and Google will be like, all right, I'll level with you. We had a data breach. We're gonna make you not only change your password, but we need to prove that you're you. And that might seem skeptical. And I've had that happen before actually with Google. And I just needed to prove that I was me. I did two-step verification. So I just, they just sent me an email and I clicked on a link in the email and it's like, okay, cool, you're Matt. Um, now you need to change your password. And I changed my password and it's like, all right, done. And so Google didn't even let me log in until I changed my password. And a lot of uh, services will do that. A lot, of, a lot of different websites will do that where when there is a data breach, they'll just, the next time you log in, they'll be like, okay, we had a data breach, change your password. Uh, and typically that solves everything. If there's a data breach, change your password. Hopefully you're fine. If you're not fine, uh, well, <laughs> you'll probably find out. Uh, but uh, the good thing, the thing that you're gonna have to look out for is you just wanna make sure you don't have a very uh, unsecure password because when there's a data breach, your passwords are stored typically on a encrypted file hosted on a server somewhere. And uh, what hackers will do is they'll try to crack your password. Uh, if you have a really complex password, even if there's a major data breach, typically they, they don't have your password, so you don't have to worry about that. But here we go, password protection. That's what I was just talking about. So passwords can be 
cracked by brute force intrusion and be revealed from data breaches. Uh, brute force. So if I didn't want to uh, gather a whole list of thousands, if not millions of emails and passwords, I don't have to be you know, anonymous or some giant hacker group in Russia. I could just target a specific person. And so if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to steal my friend Dan, I want my friend Dan, I want to steal my friend Dan's password. Well, if I know what his email is, I could just use his email address and then I could just run a program that'll run every single password in the world, which is like, ha ha ha, what are you going to do? You're going to stand there and do zero, zero, one, zero, two. Yes, I make a program that does it and the program will do it in like five seconds, depending on what the password is. So if he makes his password password, my program will guess password probably within one, one single second. If he makes his password cat 704C, my password cracker can probably guess it within three minutes. Depending on how nice my computer is, it would probably take me three minutes to figure that out. And it's like, oh, that's pretty random. Wow, you got that. He made his password house 1783. My password cracker could probably get it in like five minutes. It's not that hard. These, these programs will just keep guessing combinations of random words in the dictionary and basically every, every number known to man and will use different amounts of characters until it eventually gets your password. And most passwords that people have are typically just words and numbers. And if your password is just words and numbers, your password's probably really easy to guess with a password cracker. And so similar to the data breach website, I actually have, there's a website where you can test your password. And so if you go to howsecureismypassword.net, you can see if you put in your own password and if you don't feel safe typing in your own password, I get that. It's not a form. If you put in your own password, it's not being recorded unless you have spyware on your computer. It's not being recorded. Uh, if you don't feel safe putting in your own password, you can just put in any random password, something remotely close to your own password, and it'll tell you how long it takes for a computer to guess your password. So I put in my own, one of my own passwords, and as you can see, it would take 34,000 years for a password cracker to guess my password. So I'm not too concerned about data breaches or people getting into my emails because I have a very nice password. And they'd be like, oh, well, Matt, what well, makes up a very good password? Well, I'm glad you asked. A good password is typically longer than eight characters. I would stick as close to 16 as possible. 16 is the magic number. I know that seems long, but if you can get a 16 character password and remember it, you basically won't have an impossible to crack password. Especially, you could go over to like me, and I am a computer network security specialist, so I do go overboard. I remember I, uh, I went to Chase Bank and opened an account years ago and they had me make a password. And the, I was sitting in one of the cubicles with like a bank, a banker. And he had a wireless keyboard. He moved the wireless keyboard around. He's like, all right, put in the password you want for your account. And I put in like a 36 character password that was completely random of capital, lowercase letters and numbers and symbols. And he was like, there, are you going to remember this kid? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, I hope you do because you got to put it in a second time to verify it. And I put the exact same thing in a second time and he hit enter. He was like, oh my God, you actually have that memorized. Wow. You have like the most secure password in the world. I'm not saying you have to do that. You don't need to have a 36 character password, but if you can get it to 16, even I would just stick to eight. As long as you have a combination of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, and at least one special character symbol, so like an at sign or a dollar sign or the number sign or an exclamation mark, as long as you have a combination of that, and I would do personally a random combination of that. That means, so try not to include common words or strings of words. So if you do cat with a capital C, one, two, three, four, dollar sign, do you meet my requirements? I suppose, but it would be easy for a password cracker to guess that because you have the word cat in there. And since you're putting a word in there, you know, oh, well, the cat has a capital C. Okay, so it takes twice as long for the computer to figure it out, big deal. 
it, you know, now instead of 15 minutes to crack it, it takes 30 minutes to crack it. If I really wanted to get your password, I'd still get it in 30 minutes. If you do random numbers, random letters, if you make it totally random, no one's, no one's going to get your password. Uh, and you don't have to do, you don't have to, you know, oh, well, I want to use something that I'll remember. Well, then just don't make the C capital, make the A capital. If you do cat, whatever password I said, and you make the A capital, it, the computer is not going to know that you made the A capital. And so as far as the computer's concerned, that's kind of random. And so just as simple as you know, not making the C capital, making the A capital could trip it up by like a couple of years. It might take an extra year for the computer to figure it out. No one's going to run a computer program for a year to guess your password. So something like that. I would do if, because most people aren't going to do like a random password. And if you do a random password, you could write it down. I wouldn't, uh, I don't, if you live with like a lot of people, you probably don't want your personal password for like your bank accounts written on a piece of paper or like under your keyboard. Because if you have roommates or something, or like a lot of family members, they're going to find it. And you know, they might write it down. Now you got two copies of the same password written down on a piece of paper, who knows who's going to see it. So I'd stick away from writing it down. Uh, definitely stick away from having it on like a Word document on your desktop. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> That's a terrible idea because if someone gets a hold of, you know, you get a virus or something, you get uh, any type of like, you know, anytime, well, sorry, anytime someone gets access to your computer, you generally just have your password on your desktop. That's a terrible idea. I'd never do that. Uh, what you could do is if you have it on an encrypted file on your computer, then you don't have to worry about that. And it's like, oh, what? I'm not a, I'm not a computer hackery person. What am I going to do? Make an encrypted file on my computer? No, but you can get a password manager that does that for you. So if you go to Google Chrome, Google Chrome has, they got like a built-in password manager, but you can use third-party add-ons. So your, your internet browser, Google Chrome, Safari, uh, it, uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and uh, Microsoft Edge, yeah, terrible ones. Uh, Firefox, Google Chrome, Safari, you use those, uh, or if you're cool and you use Opera or Tor, or uh, what's the other one that I'm thinking of? Any, any of those. If you use any of those browsers, you can get a password manager, or you can get just programs on your computer that are password managers. And then anytime you need to use your password, your password manager will remember it. They'll make a password for you. They'll have it secured on an encrypted document that's in your computer that, you know, sometimes it's not even in the computer. Sometimes it's in a server, a secure server that's, you know, in California protected in a data center that no one can ever access. Well, that no one's going to get your password. Uh, if you want to, if you want to do some research on password managers, you, you might want to invest in a password manager. They're, they're, most of them are free. There are a couple paid ones. Uh, personally, I would stick to the paid ones, which sounds awful. People are like, what, you want to pay money for something that should be free? Well, the, some of the ones that are free have had data breaches where they lose their password. It's not that it matters, it's a password manager. And the data breach, again, doesn't really mean anything because the passwords are so complex, the data breach really means nothing. But if you're using a password manager to store your own personal password, the data breach could mean that somebody has your password. Uh, of course, if I were to tell you that, oh, the, the, the paid for password managers are more secure, statistically speaking, yes, they are. Uh, and in reality, they also get data breaches. You know, it, it, I, would, I, I wouldn't say nobody's safe, but you know, I think everybody can fall victim to data breaches. So it happens. Uh, I would feel more safe using the paid password managers. Me personally, I don't use a password manager. I have a completely random combination of numbers and letters as 36 characters long. If you can do the same thing with just eight characters, I think if you do it long enough, you'll remember your password and I would stick to that. So that's everything for passwords. Antivirus software. Uh, this is, most people are familiar. There's a lot of, lot of names I'm sure people are uh, familiar with. McGaffey, uh, Norton. I, I've never heard of Bullguard. Bitdefender is a big one. I love Bitdefender. AVG. 
there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of ones that people are familiar with. So antivirus software protects your devices and uh, from viruses and unwanted files and programs in your computer that could be stealing your information. So we went over all the scary things that your computer can have. You could have malware and uh, you know, oh my computer could have root kits. I went over that. It wasn't on the list, but root kits. I could have all this, you know, potentially ransomware that hasn't kicked in yet. I could have all these things. Oh, how do I protect against this? Um, well, if you already got it on your computer, you clicked on a file you shouldn't have, or for some reason you just have viruses on your computer, you just run a antivirus scan and your antivirus will be like, hey, there's a virus. We, uh, we deleted it for you. That's it. It's just that easy. And if it's like, oh, that's amazing. Should I get one? Uh, got good news for you. Do you have Windows 10? Don't need one. Windows 10 has its own antivirus software called Windows Defender. Uh, typically people use a third party antivirus program to protect their computer even further. As of today, uh, if you've updated your Windows 10 computer in the past, I don't know, three and a half years, you should be able to use Windows Defender and another antivirus software. The one that people are very familiar with is Norton. Norton has it's been, a, it's been around for a very long time. People are very familiar with it. And if you are a Comcast subscriber, you have Norton for free. Most people, a lot of people have Comcast. It's nationwide service. I mean, it's, it's big. And if you, are, if you are subscribed to, you know, you're paying for Comcast internet, bam, you have Norton for free. It's, it's offered, and I think, in like every package for free for further internet. They're partnered with Norton. So you'll get Norton as part of your internet package. You just download it on your computer. You get Norton. And uh, the best part is, again, if, you, if you've updated your computer within the past three or four years, you can use Norton and use Windows Defender. You got like two lines of defenses against your computer. And so you'll have a firewall from Norton and a firewall on uh, your, you know, Windows Defender. And they're, they'll be protecting you all the time. That's pretty awesome. Uh, be sure to scan for viruses every so often or have your software do automatic scans. Uh, make sure you always have your firewall on. Uh, yeah, so like if you download Norton or something or some free antivirus like AVG, there's one called 360 Total Security. Uh, you can set these, you could set any of these programs up to like scan every day, every week. You don't necessarily have to do it every day. Some of these scans are pretty complex and they take a very long time to perform. It might take Oh God, I got a pretty big computer. If I wanted to do a full scan on my computer, I think it takes about one or two hours to do a full scan. Uh, but you don't have to do a full scan and you don't have to do a scan every day. Uh, I probably perform a scan every week and that, that's probably a little overkill. Uh, you probably don't have to scan every week. You could probably get away doing a virus scan every month uh, and it'll scan for viruses and it'll remove them. Uh, the one thing that I will say that's kind of important, it's not something that you should be too concerned with, but if you're very concerned about viruses and all the different things, in the beginning of the PowerPoint, I shared with you all the list of all the scary things your computer could have, harmful things to your computer. Not all of these programs can remove all of those things. Some programs can only, they're only designed to remove ransomware, some are only designed to remove malware. Some are only designed to remove adware. Some of them only remove a combination of things. And the reason I say that is I'm pretty sure just looking at every single one of these, none of the ones that show up here, I don't think any of them remove rootkits. Uh, rootkits are very hard to defend against and only certain software can like remove a rootkit from your computer. If you scan for viruses, rootkit might not show up. Rootkits are bound to the root of the computer. Your virus scan might not even be scanning in the right spot to find a rootkit. So how do you defend against a rootkit? You got to look up a, a antivirus software that scans for rootkits. So if you're uh, trying to find an antivirus software that's best for you, look up what it does. They'll tell you what they do. It'll say, oh, this is our antivirus software. It'll defend against rootkits, viruses, malware, adware, spyware. It'll do everything. I was like, oh, well, this thing does everything. I'll 
get that. And what you'll probably notice is most of these antivirus softwares that offer everything, they cost money. Norton costs money. It's free if you have, again, if you have Comcast, it's free, but a lot of them cost money. Uh, me personally, as a computer network security specialist, I'd never pay a dime for antivirus. That's my, my honest opinion is I would never pay a dime for antivirus. I don't think there's any reason to. You can get the same kind of protection, the same level of protection from free antivirus software. Uh, you don't even have to be a Comcast subscriber. You don't, have to, you don't need to use Norton. I, I'm a Comcast, Comcast subscriber. I get Comcast, so I get free Norton. I don't even use Norton. I use uh, free one-of-the-mill antivirus software. It scans. It basically gets absolutely everything, scans everything, bam, will delete any viruses. And again, I use it every week. I could probably get away with it using it uh, every month or even less than that. Uh, if something harmful comes on my computer, it's doing live active protection. It'll autom automatically tell me usually like, hey, you just downloaded something that was unsafe. We deleted it. That's pretty awesome. And remember, that's just a third party antivirus software. Windows 10 already has Windows Defender. So if you're scouring the internet, oh, I have to get antivirus software. If you're on Windows 10, you don't have to. You already have antivirus software. You have Windows Defender. Windows Defenders should always be running, and there's no reason it should be turned off. If you download something from the internet and it gives you, a, if it tries to get past Windows Defender, it'll give you a pop-up on your computer. It'll say user account control, and it'll say Windows Defender, and it'll say this program, and it'll say what the program is, wants to turn off Windows Defender. Uh, personally, I don't see any reason that any program should be doing that. So if you get a pop-up that says that, if you get a pop-up that says Windows Defender and it's trying to turn off Windows Defender, you should say no. Probably a virus. It shouldn't be doing that. Uh, that being said, if you get a pop-up from Windows Defender, it's not necessarily something bad. It could just be Windows Defender telling you, hey, this, this, this is a program. We don't know what it is. Is it okay if we run the program? And you could say yes. And if it's something bad, Windows Defender will try its best to stop it from harming your computer. And if it's not, you've got nothing to worry about. So antivirus software is awesome. Uh, but again, I wouldn't, re I wouldn't rely on antivirus software for everything. I would stick to use common sense. Typically, the reason the antivirus software needs to exist in the first place is you did something to put something bad on your computer, which is understandable. You know, it's the whole point of like getting a virus is you you're not going out of your way to get one. It, it, it just sort of happens. You know, you might be visiting a sketchy website. Someone could have, you fallen victim to something. So back up your data. Okay. Let's say everything that we were talking about fell through. Uh, you, had you had an amazing password. Doesn't matter. Uh, you checked for all these emails. You checked, you scanned every single email. You thought every single one of them looked legit. You, but unfortunately, one got the best of you, and bam, you got your information stolen from you. Or, you know, oh, you got an infection on your computer. You got a virus. It wiped some hacker. I got ransomware. Oh, no. I downloaded ransomware on my computer. My computer's now held hostage. What do I do? Well, if you back up your data, you don't have to do anything. Who cares? It's a good practice to back up your files and data. And uh, you could do this on your phone too. That's one thing I, I, I've been talking about computers all the time. That you could do all the same things on your phone. Uh, if you have an iPhone, typically don't have to worry about this stuff because viruses don't really happen on iPhones. Uh, but they can, uh, very rare. Androids, I've gotten, an and I've gotten a virus on an Android because I went out of my way to get one. And other than me going out of my way to get a virus on an Android, I can't really say I've heard of people getting viruses on their Android phones. It's not that it doesn't happen. It pretty much doesn't happen, though. So I wouldn't, if, you, if you're worried about viruses on your phone, it doesn't really happen. You really have nothing to worry about. The only thing that you'd have to worry about on your phone is, like, phishing from, like, emails. So if you, if you think, oh, someone hacked my account because I was on my phone, well, it was probably phishing. You're probably on a very suspicious website. You filled out information to the wrong person is what you did. But like viruses, you really don't have to worry about that on the phone. But you can still back up your stuff on your phone. What happens if, uh, for example, like I have my phone here. What if I'm on a 105-story building and I throw this out the window? 
I'd be wondering what building I'm on. <laughs> That's awesome that I can open the window on the 105, you know, story building. But, uh, you know, what happens if this, if I drop this in the water, you know, bam, it's actually a bad example. My phone's waterproof. But if you don't have a waterproof phone and you drop it in the water, let's say I drop this phone in the middle of the ocean. Okay, who cares that it's waterproof? It's in the middle of the ocean. I'm, I'm on a cruise ship, even though there's no cruise ships right now, bad example. But Say I drop this in the middle of the ocean, I'm never going to recover it. I'm not going to hire a, you know, a deep diving team that, you know, helped, you know, recover stuff from the Titanic to find my phone. That's ridiculous. Uh, well, I just buy a new phone. Oh, well, what about all my data? Well, I lose all my data. If I back it all up, who cares? Doesn't matter. All the stuff that's on my phone can be backed up. Uh, I went over this a little bit in privacy and I went over it more. We have another class on, uh, digital photo storage. So there's two different options for backing data up. There is a physical option, there's a cloud option. So you can get, you could back stuff up on cloud storage or you can have a physical copy of backup. So Microsoft Office 365, I don't know if anyone has that. If you have, for example, Microsoft Office 365, you actually get a thousand gigabytes of cloud storage for free from Microsoft called Microsoft OneDrive. Uh, but there's there's more uh, cloud options you can get. If you do Google, Google has a service where you can use their, uh, you know, uh, cloud service. And they give you for free, like a couple gigabytes or something like five, even probably like 10 or 15. I don't know how many they give, but you can get free storage on Google. And if all you're trying to do is like, you don't have to back everything up. Like if you're on your phone, you might only want to back up like your photos. You could back up all your photos on your phone to Google for free. And then if you lose your phone, or even if you just, you know, buy a new phone, oh, I don't want to lose all my photos. You didn't lose anything. They're, all, they're still on Google. You, you don't have to worry about anything that's on your phone. You could, you could have everything on your phone deleted, or you can have your phone destroyed. Doesn't matter. Uh, similarly, your computer, uh, if you're concerned, you'll get a virus or ransomware or something will happen, tornado happens. It's a good practice to back up your data. You can buy an external hard drive, uh, retail stores, or you could uh, you could buy one online at like Amazon. You could buy like a 1,000 gigabyte, 2,000 gigabyte, or you know one or two terabyte, same thing, uh, external hard drive. And you could put all the stuff that you want to on these hard drives. And then you have a physical copy. You don't have to pay every month for a service and you have a backup. So if the computer goes bad, you could just have the computer wiped. It's clean now brand new computer basically. And you can just put all your stuff back on it from the uh, data backup. That's fantastic, you know, wow. I don't know who wouldn't do that. That's, that's what I, I actually back up my data quite a bit. Uh, I use both. I back up my photos and important documents uh, to cloud storage. And then I also have a physical backup on an external hard drive. So if anything ever happens, if there's a, if there, I guess if there's a tornado, my computer and the external hard drive, they're in the same place. So if a tornado happens, chances are it doesn't really do anything. But, you know, if my computer gets hacked or something and uh, everything gets wiped, I still have a backup, so it doesn't matter. And you would think, oh, well, how often does that happen? It's actually happened quite a bit to me. And I, I've been very thankful that I backed up my data because I, I didn't have to worry about it at all. I'm like, oh no, my computer's bad. I wiped my computer. I just put everything back on my computer. It took like an hour, but what's the alternative? My, my alternative is to just lose everything. And it took a one-time investment of having like an external hard drive. And you know, like you can get an external hard drive for as little as like 30 bucks for like a one terabyte hard drive. Uh, of course, that'd be like if it was on sale or something, but you could just check on Amazon or something, how much they cost. You can get usually pretty good deals on external hard drives or even external solid state drives. If you want these uh, external storage uh, devices to be really fast, you can get external solid state drives now. Those are really fancy. Uh, they're also like four times more expensive. So, I mean, weigh your options there. How often are you gonna be using it? If it's just to back stuff up, maybe you don't need a solid state drive. But, and again, this is something that I went over in the digital photo storage class. The benefit of a solid state drive is it's less likely to be damaged. If you buy an external hard drive, remember there is an actual laser optical disc 
in a box. If you shake that hard drive around or you throw it about or like it's in a closet in a box and you're moving boxes around, that disc can get scratched up. Everything that's on that disc can be damaged. If you got a solid state drive, which it is four times more expensive, that's a lot less likely. There's no physical disc. There's not, there's over a hundred moving parts in a, in a hard drive, an optical drive. And any, any type, any type of those, that they're all lots of moving parts, magnetic strips, you know, you got all sorts of components. Solid state drive doesn't have any of that. It's a circuit board. It's very light too. And it's very thin. Uh, it's actually kind of concerning. It might be easy to lose. And so, I mean, the, some people are nice. Uh, some, I know SanDisk makes a external solid state drive. That's like a clip on, you can like store it on your person. And they actually make technically solid state storage that is portable. That's what a flash drive is. It's the same kind of technology. So if you have a flash drive, you actually own, you already own technically it, that's flash storage technology. Uh, uh, external solid state drive is just like a really small version of an external solid state drive. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I would definitely invest in that. Definitely important to back up your data. Use a virtual private network. All right, a lot to talk about here. Uh, I think most people, not most people, but definitely a lot of people on the internet have heard of a VPN and they might not have any idea at all what it is. So a virtual private network masks the user's IP address. Uh, that way you're invisible to people on the internet, more or less. Your IP address is unique to your device and can tell others where you live. That is true. Uh, if your public IP address is static, it'll also basically tell others who you are since it does not change. That's true as well, yeah. Uh, you can use a VP, uh, VPN to change your IP address uh, as others view it, and in doing so can, can pretend to even be from another country. Yeah, so I don't know why you'd want to. I can come up with a couple examples if you wanted, but like if you get a VPN and almost every single VPN service I can think of is a paid service, uh, you might see advertisements on the internet. Big ones are like Nord. I actually use a VPN service. It's private internet, private internet access or PIA. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones that exist though. Nord VPN is very big. Uh, there, there is one Tunnel Bear. I don't know if that exists still. I think it does exist. I haven't heard about Tunnel Bear in a while. Tunnel Bear exists. There's a couple other big ones though, but those virtual private networks, basically you turn them on. They're like programs almost on your computer. They'll change some settings around in your computer. Uh, and I say computer, you can get, yeah, you can uh, use a VPN easily on a computer or your phone. So it doesn't have to be just the computer. You can use it on your phone too. The uh, same services. So you pay money uh, or you don't pay money. They have a couple free ones. Personally, I'd invest money on the paid ones for reasons I'll get into. They'll change your IP address and they'll basically make you invisible on the internet. And so when you log in, you're logging in from a different IP address every single time, super secure and everything you do is just magically become safe. It's kind of ju just that easy. Uh, if for some reason you wanted to pretend to be from another country, you could do that even. You could turn on the VPN and bam, you're now from France or Germany or Russia or wherever you want to be. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the point of that? Why would I want to be pretending to be from Germany? Uh, copyright laws. If there's a YouTube video that's, oh, this, vi this video is not available in your country because it has copyright material from the Walt Disney Corporation. Well, that might be true for the United States, but copyright laws are different in other countries. So if you view that as someone from France, you might be able to watch the country. And it's like, oh, big deal. What am I supposed to do? Take my computer and go all the way to France and watch the video? You don't have to. You have a VPN. And so your VPN, you can set your VPN to change your IP address as if it's coming from France. And the second you just set that up, and usually it's very easy, these programs, the one that I use, private internet access, I just say, select your country, France, bam. Now my computer thinks it's in France and the internet thinks I'm in France. And so if I go back to that YouTube video that I couldn't watch in the United States because of copyrighted material from Disney, I could watch it, no problem, because it thinks I live in France. Uh, and you might ask, oh, isn't that illegal? Nope, totally legal. That's totally fine. Uh, kind of. There's 
the 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 very act of using a VPN isn't against the law. What you do on the internet might be. So <laughs> people have that misconception all the time where it's all, oh, if you use a VPN, everything is legal. It's not true. Uh, it makes it easier to break the law, but using a VPN is not against the law. In and of itself, you could use a VPN all day. Uh, people might be familiar with what torrenting is. If you torrent with a VPN, no one will know that you're torrenting anything. And if you don't know what torrenting is, more or less it's downloading, it's, it's, it's kind of like downloading stuff. And people typically use torrenting to like torrent like video games or movies or TV shows and stuff. And so if you're torrenting a video game that you don't want to pay for or a movie that you don't want to pay for, that's against the law. You can't do that. And you can be tracked for doing that. If you're using a VPN, not being tracked, you're using a VPN. Are you breaking the law? Yes, you're still breaking the law. Using a VPN is not against the law, but you torrenting is still illegal. It's just uh, suddenly it becomes almost impossible for you to get caught. Something, something to think about. I would never condone doing that. I would never do that. That's a terrible decision. Don't do that. But VPNs, VPNs are legal. In my opinion, I would always use one. Uh, I mentioned earlier briefly the difference between a paid and a free VPN. Typically, the difference is if you're paying for really fast internet, when you use a VPN, your internet suddenly becomes not very fast. If you're trying to watch a 4K video on YouTube, you might not be able to do that on a VPN. If you're using a free VPN, I 100% guarantee you, you cannot watch a 4K video on YouTube. Uh, if you're using a paid VPN, you might be able to. Uh, they typically have higher speeds. And the important thing is they don't have a uh, bandwidth or like a data cap. And so some of these free VPNs, what they'll do is they'll be like, oh, you can use our VPN, but you can only use up to one gigabyte a month with these paid ones, they're like, go, go at it. Use, it. use our service as much as you want, whenever you want on multiple devices. You could use 10 million gigabytes a month. We don't care. Infinity data cap, no data cap, do whatever you want. That's pretty awesome. And it comes at a price. And I know that sounds terrible, but they're typically not that expensive. For as little as like $30, you can get like well over a year of service from these virtual private networks. So I would definitely invest in a VPN. And a VPN, if you're just using the internet to browse stuff, a VPN might be overkill. Uh, and if you've done, if, you, if you're doing everything, you have a really secure password, you're scouring the internet, using common sense, looking for fake stuff, you have a third party antivirus service as well as, uh, as, well as Windows Defender, you're on top of your game with security, Adding a VPN on top of that, is it a little overkill? Yes, but let me tell you, if you're doing everything, you got this VPN, you got all this antivirus software, you got your stuff backed up. If you do all these things, you're never gonna have to complain about, oh, a hacker got my data ever again. That like, there's just no way. You have like a fail safe for everything at that point. So something to keep, this is, this is the important one. This is the important one. Keep your computer and phone up to date. Sometimes uh, if your information is compromised or your computer gets a virus, it may not be your fault. It might be your, your, your software manufacturer's fault. Well, who's my software manufacturer? What does that mean? Oh, your operating system. You have a Windows computer? That's Microsoft's problem, Microsoft Windows problem. Uh, Apple, if you have a MacBook, might be Apple's problem they might have had a flaw in their operating system that allowed for people, organizations, hacker groups to steal your information. Oh, that's pretty bad. Can I sue them? No, you actually made an agreement when you bought the computer or just by using their service that you couldn't sue them for that. So nice try, uh, you can't do that. But luckily it's like, oh, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, well, anytime something like that happens, they'll just have an update where they patch out any security flaws and they'll typically add new stuff to the operating system as well. 
And so people think that when they have to, they have, a, they have an update for their phone or their computer, it's like, oh, it's just adding new features. Yes, it, typ it typically does add new fancy features. The important thing is that it's also adding more layers of security to the operating system. People that have iPhones, they'll see, oh, I have a new iOS update, but it doesn't say it adds anything cool. It's just a security update. Who cares about a security update? Uh, you might want to download that. The security update might protect you from having all your data stolen from a company. So, or like a, you know, a hacker. So you want to keep your, your uh, devices up to date for that reason alone. Uh, the reason people are like, oh, I have a really old computer and it still has updates. They're for security reasons. Uh, they'll, they'll update these computers not to add new features because they need to update their old devices for security reasons. And it gets to a point where these developers, will, they'll just want to stop, like, oh, they have to update. If there's a big security flaw, they have to update everything. So when Microsoft has a security flaw, they'll have to update Windows 10, update Windows 8.1, update Windows 8, update Windows 7. And at one point, they're just like, this is too much effort for us. We're wasting too much money on this. So you know what they do? They cut support for whoever's on the bottom of the list. And just this last year, that was Windows 7. So if you have a Windows 7 computer, you don't get security updates anymore. They gave you your last one. You don't get any more features and major security updates they're just not going to give. They're, they're not supporting Windows 7 anymore. And so if you have Windows 10 or like a new iPhone, newer iPhone, always keep your operating systems up to date, always download the newest update. If you have like an older computer or an older iPhone, it might be time to buy a new device. You might have to buy a new computer that uses Windows 10 or buy a newer phone that's on the newer versions of Android or iOS. Uh, Apple does a very good job of supporting old devices the past like 10 iPhones are still supported uh, with at least security updates. The past almost decade of phones are still on like the newest version of iOS and even, even more insane with Macs. Macs are supported for like forever. Oh man, there's way more than a decade. They, they still get updates. So Apple, that's one thing that Apple does very well they will support their stuff for a very, very long time. Uh, as for other devices, Android phones, uh, Windows computers, they're not usually as supposedly, if you have Windows 10, uh, Microsoft's claim is you are supported forever. We don't know about that so far. They've kept true to their word out of the like seven years it's existed or however long Windows 10 has existed, yeah, they've kept their word. Everything's been in support. They claim Windows 10 will always be supported and will never be obsolete and will always be supported forever. It's the last version of Windows apparently. So we'll see, we'll see what's made of that. But if you have Windows 7, that's not supported anymore. Eventually they'll cut support for Windows 8 and it'll only be Windows 10. That's not their evil plot to try to get everyone onto Windows 10. That's, it's, it becomes a liability for them to have to keep updating old operating systems. They, they have to you know, adapt to the newer technologies and you know, change stuff in the future. So but yeah, so if you're using hardware that's no longer supported by developer, you might not be able to download new updates. And then when you have an update, just update. Uh, you know, connect to the internet, update your phone or your computer, and then you should you don't have to worry about those things anymore. You know, if there's a security risk, just updating your phone makes that security flaw in the operating system go away forever. So that's something to think about. So that's everything. That's a lot to go through. I said I was going to keep it under an hour, and uh, I, I knew I was going to go over an hour. So that's 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 pretty much everything. There's a couple more things I probably could have gone into detail about. And I know there was definitely a couple things I went a little bit fast on. So if anyone has any questions at all, you can feel free to ask any questions. I am I'm more than willing to answer them. Uh, my name, as you can see in the corner here, I'm Matthew Montalvo. I'm an IT assistant at the Orland Park Public Library. Uh, I don't have my email on here. That's interesting. But if you have any questions, you could feel free to call me. Uh, if you call the help desk uh, 
extension there. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, my email is not on here, but it should be mmontalvo, which is on the screen there, at orlandparklibrary.org. You can ask me any questions via email. I'd do my best to get back to you in a timely manner and answer any of your questions. We have other upcoming classes also all on Zoom uh, as well. So we have social media marketing basics on Zoom. That's coming pretty soon. We have job hunting. Uh, this one's cool. I like this one. Is cloud storage right for me? That I'll go more into cloud storage. I went over that briefly today. That's an entire class on it. Something to think about. And then shopping on the internet. That's a cool one that you might want to look at as well. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask me. I'll wait here for a bit. I'll try to think about anything else that I could elaborate on. Uh, yeah, the, the important one that people probably would miss, and that I've seen other IT professionals that have talked about the subject of internet security that people miss is the, the updating your operating system. You could take all the steps in the world, but if you have an old computer or an old phone, it doesn't matter that you have antivirus software or even that you're on like a VPN, that stuff might not matter because, you know, you got an operating system that's like obsolete. It's just going to run slow on, on top of the fact that there is a security risk that you're never able to fix because the person that made your operating system, they're not necessarily obligated to uh, patch it. The federal government does force manufacturers to release some updates for these operating systems every so often if there's like a giant flaw with the operating system. They are forced to comply with federal government regulations. So if you have Windows 7, I said like, oh, it was stopped being supported a year ago. I, th I think the last update for Windows 7 was like three months ago. And it's like, oh, but I thought they stopped supporting it a year ago. Well, the government does force them to update it. If there is a, and there was a giant security, there was like a massive security flaw with Windows 7 that hackers found out about um, Microsoft. Basically, the federal government was like, yeah, you guys have to fix that. You, if you guys don't fix that, that's a problem. And so Microsoft's like, okay, well, I'll fix it. So they patched it. But they're not going to do that for everything. All the small security flaws, they don't fix with Windows 7. They only do that with Windows 10. And that's why people are like, oh, you know, Windows 10, I get an update. You know, my computer stops. I ask for an update every two weeks. They're updating potentially security risks and flaws like that. They'll do that every, every chance they get. So it's important to keep your system up to date, phone up to date, just keep them up to date. And if you do, if you've taken every step that I've labeled in this uh, video, then, I mean, you're, you're pretty, you're good. That's everything. So it uh, doesn't look like there's any questions. So uh, we're going to go ahead and end it there. Thank you for uh, watching the Orland Park Public Library, and uh, we'll see you hopefully at a couple more of our classes in the future.